Thank you for the intro introduction, Michelle. Um, disclaimer, I am not a professional baker. In fact, I did, used to dislike baking before I started getting into sourdough bread. But bread is an important part of my diet and my heritage. As it turns out, baking is quite common in our family. My great grandfather was a pastry chef in the uh, 1930s. Uh, and there's a bakery in East Germany that was founded by a great uncle. And my brother Ole and his wonderful wife Rahel have a bakery in Northern Germany. They bake bread with special flowers and I'm honored to wear this t-shirt with their logo today. Sorry. In 1990, uh, 2019, I began baking yeast bread in the bread maker and enjoyed experimenting with different recipes. But during the pandemic at the end of March, <coughs> stores ran out of yeast. A friend gave me some of her sourdough starter and I've baked sourdough bread every weekend since. Today, I would like to share with you what I've learned. I will share some of my methods, tools, and ingredients. I will briefly talk about the history of sourdough as a leavening agent, when we will touch on the chemistry that makes it all work. Sourdough baking is an ancient trade and there are many very good bakers worldwide. I focus on the bread we like to eat. I encourage you to experiment and grow beyond what I can show you. I'm not a professional baker and I have a lot more to learn. Bread production relied on sourdough for most of human history. As a matter of fact, there are, is evidence that um, the ancient Egyptians already used sourdough um, when they started using wheat as a grain. And sourdough was that one leavening agent until it was replaced by barm from, from beer brewing process in the European Middle Ages. And that is basically the spent yeast from brewing beer. In 1871, um, people started uh, purpose, purpose culture yeast um, to make it more reliable. And French baker, bakers brought sourdough to California during the gold rush. And then the gold rush, uh, the Klondike gold rush brought it into Canada in 1889. Sourdough um, is basically using the natural enzymes and yeasts in uh, that, that encase the grain, the, the wheat grain, uh, and, and make, make that work. Um, and that is why it is important, for example, to not use bleached uh, flour when you bake sourdough bread, as I learned in the beginning. Um, so because of the slow fermentation, um, sourdough bread is actually easier to digest even for some celiac patients that can't digest bread. Uh, they can digest uh, sourdough bread. Uh, and it also has a lower glycemic index. Um, if you're uh, diabetic, uh, sourdough bread might be better for you to eat. Um, so it's a little bit magic, and we will see later on how we um, how how that works with the starter. So I'm going to talk about my tools a little bit. I'm going to stop the sharing. Again, um, my tools are just what I've used. Uh, there are very few things that I would like um, to add at some point, uh, but. Um, these work for me. So the Dutch oven will make an appearance later. Uh, it's in the oven right now, heating up. Uh, baking in the Dutch oven keeps the steam rising from the dough in and helps the development of the oven spring, basically the rising of the bread. Uh, before I had a Dutch oven, I poured a cup of water in a dish in the oven. It, that worked, but the bread didn't rise as much. All you need is an oven-proof container with a lid that is big enough. Um, the, the container is big enough. Uh, my cast iron Dutch oven is one my mother-in-law got from a garage sale and used in the garden. I just cleaned it up, seasoned it, and I'm using it all the time. Uh, the other magic ingredient is a simple digital scale. 
as in most baking, accurate measurements are important. Cup measurements are difficult to get accurate, and my old analog kitchen scale was not ideal. Then we bought this scale from Facebook Marketplace, and things got so much easier. Bowls. I love to use these large pudding basins, but you can use any vessel large enough. Make sure they're big enough because the oven doubles, uh, the dough doubles uh, in size or more. Some people say you should not use metal bowls. Uh, I've not tried this. I use kitchen towels to cover the bowl during the rise times. Before I got this dough whisk for Christmas, um, I thought it was a gimmick. Turns out the whisk works much better for stirring together the ingredients than a spoon. I use a, a lot in cooking and baking now. The bench scraper, um, this handy tool is a bench scraper. It comes in handy to transfer the dough into the banneton and especially for softer loaves. It works also great for cutting dough and scones and whatever uh, else you're baking. Banneton, I have to get out of the fridge. Because holds today's dough and bread. So the banneton, is um, uh, a basket um, with, a, with a liner, with a cloth liner. Some people use the banneton um, without the liner and then makes those uh, fancy rings that you sometimes see, uh, but that's a lot of cleaning. If you use this way, you basically I use that all over and over and over again. A banneton is a nice to have, uh, you could also use a col colander lit lined with a towel. Um, and, but you can also get oval ban banetons and different sizes. And the liner keeps the dough in, uh, from getting stuck in the grooves. Oven gloves. Bread is baked at high temperatures between 450 and 500 Fahrenheit especially handling the hot cast iron lid from the Dutch oven, the neoprene gloves keep me safe. This thing is called a bread sling. You want to prevent the bread from sticking to your Dutch oven and you want to be able to take the finished loaf out, of, uh, out to cool down. In the beginning, I used parchment paper for this. The problem was that it got brittle in the oven and could not be reused. I bought a silicone oven mat that can be cut to size and cut this shape. You can see the handles that help getting the loaf in and out of the, of the hot oven. The one thing I don't have, um, because I don't really need it, and because I haven't made one, uh, is a lamb. Uh, it's called L, L, uh, it's spelled L A M E, and that is used to score the bread before uh, uh, before it goes in the oven, and that the scoring um, allows the steam to rise out of the bread and uh, helps the 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 dough rise nicely into a nice loaf of bread. To score the bread, you need a very sharp blade, and I find that holding the safety razor in the in my hand works well for me. There are many designs for lamb handles around and I'm still dreaming of making one myself. Bread knife. Especially when you start baking bread regularly, a good bread knife makes a big difference. This one is a Mercer Culinary Millennia 10 inch wide bread knife. And, uh, Good bread knife is a bit of an investment, but it stays sharp for a long time and it will be worth sharpening in a few years. Ingredients. Sourdough bread only needs three ingredients, flour, water, and starter. And that is part of why I like it so much because I know what goes in it. When I started out, I used the flour we had in the house. We had a big bag of all-purpose flour. The problem was that it was bleached and the bleaching process kills a lot of the natural yeast used for sourdough fermentation. 
Today, I use mostly whole wheat and white flour, bread flour that has a high protein and gluten content. And you can add gluten to your fl flour, but I have discovered that fresh flour from Rogers Mills in Armstrong works great for me. For a variety, I use semolina flour or rye flour from Anita's Mill in Chilliwack. I also like their seven grain mix for uh, multigrain breads. If you drive down to the lower mainland, like we did last week, um, stop in at their store in Chilliwack. Uh, you, you, they have an incredible amount of uh, organic uh, flour. And you can find all of that information on the resource page of my blog. Water, salt, and other inclusions. Our tap water doesn't include any chlorine chlorine in Kelowna. Bakers have a lot of, that have a lot of chlorine in the water prefer to use bottled water. I use simple salt from the grocery store uh, and have not experimented with different salts. And some recipes include uh, additions like multigrain mix, herbs, cheese, olives, garlic, and many other things. Now the magic ingredient is the starter, which is also nothing other than flour and water. And sometimes it feels like keeping sourdough starter is like keeping a pet. It's not quite like that. Yes, if you have to feed the cultures regularly, but keep it in the, if you keep them in the fridge, these cultures can survive for quite a while. You just have to wake them up a day or two before you want to bake. Because it takes four to six hours for the starter to be ready to use, I created a little time lapse to speed it, speed it up for you. And now I have to share my screen. Every sourdough starter is a little bit like an individual character. Everyone acts a little bit different and temperature and weather play a role. I received my first starter from a friend, but it got less and less active after a few times. Today I know this was probably due to the bleach flour I was using. At the time I thought I had done something wrong. I decided to make my own starter. I still use it today and many bakers use starters that are many, many years old. I feed my starter whole wheat flour. Other people use all-purpose or even rye flour. I li like to use glass jars from pasta sauce because they are easy to clean. On Thursdays, I take the glass out of the fridge and start feeding it twice a day. I add 50 grams of flour and 50 grams of non-chlorinated water to 50 grams of starter. Over the next 48 hours, the microbes digest the flour and the gases produce the bubbles you see in the video. In the winter, I keep the starter in a room that is about 22 degrees warm. In the summer, like today, it is about 27 and things go faster. If I would keep feeding the starter, I would end up with way too much. So before I feed it, I transfer part of it into a jar in the fridge. We call this unfit starter discard and I use it for baking many yummy things. After I use the starter in the different loaves of bread on Sunday, I feed the starter again and put it in the fridge. Here the fermentation process continues, but a lot slower. See, now we should save five hours, uh, pretty, um, pretty handy. So um, I'm going to share, I'm going to do a bit of an experiment right now. I'm going to share, share the content of my second camera and I'm going to show you how to score the loaf and then I'll put it in the oven. Okay, that's the other side. So I will speak a little bit louder because... Uh, I don't know what's 
you know, how the microphone is picking it up. So I'm putting the bread swing onto this the dough and turn it upside down. And in the video later, you will see this process again, but my hand is always in front because the camera was on the other side. And now I make a, a cut that is about half an inch to three quarter inch deep. And because this is an Okanagan College seminar, I'm going to make an O without cutting my finger and a C. And I have done the same thing with the bread in the video. So we'll, we'll, you will see how that turns out. Now I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to stick the bread in the oven. Okay, hey, Google, set the timer for 20 minutes. 20 minutes, and we're starting now. So again, um, this, uh, this process takes quite a bit of time. So I am going to, I, I made a little video uh, about how this all works. Um, there's, the scoring is just before it goes in the oven. And there's it no is a multi-day process. Walmart Usually uh, when I want to bake the bread on Sunday morning, I start uh, in, on about Thursday to take the starter out of the fridge and feed it. We talked about the starter before. And uh, now is the time when I can actually set up the dough. That's another two-day project. Um, and uh, I made this little video because uh, during the seminar I didn't have, don't have enough time. Uh, this way we can skip all the waiting times. Sourdough um, takes a lot longer than yeast bread because there is no actual um, added yeast. It's all wild yeasts, but the slow fermentation process also makes the bread tastier and healthier. Sourdough bread really only needs three ingredients and that is flour, water and salt. Um, and so my starter is very bubbly and, and ready to go. So now I can mix the dough. You can not only see uh, the starter is bubbly, you can also smell it. It has a very nice uh, smell. The nice thing about this um, electronic scale is that I can zero out the, the scale. So I have a bowl here, fairly heavy bowl, but my scale, I can set the scale to zero so it doesn't measure the um, bowl. So we start with a sourdough starter and that's the only time I um, go away from the recipe because I use um, more whole wheat um, flour than most recipes because we just li like the taste. So I do need to use a little bit more starter to give that a little bit more power to rise. So 50 grams is what the recipe says. I usually give it 70 or 80 grams and that works out quite well. Um, once you are have used all the, sour, the, all the starter that um, you have, uh, that you have set aside for today's bake. Don't forget to feed the starter so it continues um, living. So um, starter, and then the recipe says 350 grams of warm water. Let's zero out the scale. You want the water just warm, not too hot, because you don't want to cook the cultures. 350 grams. At this point I use the whisk to um, mix up the starter and the water so it, it is nicely uniform. 
just find that it uh, then mixes better with the flour. And now I add the flour. It says 500 grams of bread, bread flour. I do have white and whole wheat bread flour and I use that about half and half. So I add 250 grams of whole wheat bread flour. about 250 grams of white bread flour. Try to stay as accurate as possible with my measurements and the electronic scale makes that fairly easy. And uh, now I mix everything up again. The special whisk makes it much easier. I used to use metal spoons that works as well. Wooden spoons um, are difficult because the dough just sticks too much to them. So I just mix this up roughly and uh, now let it sit for half an hour um, covered. I cover my bowls with the wet um, kitchen towel and that provides the protection from drafts and or anything falling in it also prevents it from drying out so I set this away put put this away and in the meantime I measure out nine grams of uh, salt usually you have about nine grams of salt for 500 grams of flour and uh, then we will go to the next step Okay, so half an hour is up. Um, now I can mix all the ingredients. I'm taking off the towel. The dough has nicely combined. Um, I decided to add some sunflower seeds to this loaf. Once you know that your recipe works, um, at making additions is, at this point is a good idea. You, you can do that at this point. Um, sometimes you need to soak whatever you put in. If I have a multi-grain loaf, uh, I need to soak the, the, gr the grains in for half an hour in hot water. So now I just combine everything. At this point, it does feel a little bit like kneading. Although sourdough bread, the way I bake it, has surprisingly little. Um, kneading is involved. So I just combine everything so that the salt is equally distributed over the dough. So it's nicely combined. Um, at this time, it is not very. This dough is not very sticky. Sometimes, when it's a little wetter, it's a, a, it's quite sticky. Um, don't add any flour at this point or anything. Just wait until it starts. The gluten starts to form, and uh, it it might be just fine. It's probably just fine. Uh, somebody else tried this on the recipe, so just trust that. Um, so I'm going to cover it again with a wet towel and leave it sit for another, let's say, 45 minutes for the next step. So 45 minutes is over um, and the dough is, has started, um, started fermenting. So now we're going to help the gluten to form better strands by pulling, stretching the dough from the side and folding it over. Uh, hopefully you can see that. So I'm pulling it and I go around the, dough, the bowl. It's kind of getting nice and stretchy now. It's going to be even better next time. So 
so it's a nice ball now. Um, it will start, uh, it will continue rising and um, fermenting. And I will repeat this twice. If your recipe says that you don't have to do that, or only once, uh, I recommend you do it anyway. Um, I have never had any dough that has turned out worse with the stretch and pull. So that is really as close as you get to kneading the dough. They're just stretching it and folding it over. So, the dough has doubled about. Um, this is much more predictable in the summer, in the winter, when the temperature is even. Right now it's a little warmer, so you have to really watch it. Um, when, if the dough overproofs, it, uh, it doesn't bake evenly and it doesn't rise as much. So, this is nice. Um, it's uh, nicely proofed, about double the size of the ball that we originally had. So the bulk proof is over. Now we're shaping the loaf. Just pulling over, making it nice and round. You can see there are some bubbles from the gas um, in the bulk ferment. I'm just pinching the ends together here. Now we're gonna try making a nice tight shape nice and round because it's going to be a round loaf um, you can tell the dough is fairly firm in this this recipe makes a fairly firm loaf in this stage um, some of the moisture ones are harder to manage and then I used a bench scraper to pick it up. In this case I don't need it. Uh, I've prepared the banneton. Uh, you see that is the basket with the liner. Put some fresh uh, flour in here and then I pick up the loaf and dump it in the banneton. And now I close this off. This is just a shower cap from the dollar store. It's a perfect cover. Um, now the dough goes in the fridge overnight for what is called the cold ferment. And it's basically um, the fermentation process um, continues, uh, but because it's in the cold environment, it goes much slower. So I put this in the fridge overnight. Um, some people leave it even longer than overnight, uh, depending on the recipe. But uh, we're gonna let this rest in the fridge overnight and then we'll bake it tomorrow morning. So now the oven is preheated to 450 degrees and I can take the dough out of the fridge after the cold ferment. It looks very nice, nice and ground and even. And I can put it upside down on my bread sling. The bread sling has these handles, so that makes it easier to put into the Dutch oven. Um, if I want to have a nice um, contrast on the pattern that I'm scoring, I can uh, put fresh flour on the top and rub it in. Some people use rice flour because that stays white. Uh, I use just a razor blade in my hand. Um, some other people have different um, uh, tools for scoring. It just needs to be very sharp uh, to cut into the dough. Because the dough is cool, it is fairly easy to, um, to cut. The scoring is um, there to allow the steam to escape from the loaf and not press the dough down. So I need to make at least one major score fairly deep. Using the safety razor is a really good way to do that. I realized that my arm is always in front of the camera. An O and a C. Um, you can also make smaller cuts. 
they are more decorative than um, than anything else. Uh, but some people make really elaborate scoring patterns, which are great. Um, but today we are not going to do that. Now we are ready to put the bread into the Dutch oven and bake it. So the oven is hot, it's at 450 degrees and I preheated the Dutch oven with it so everything is really hot so my trusty neoprene gloves come in really handy and so does the bread sling, you can see that I can just drop the bread into the Dutch oven with the handles close it close the lid so the steam can stay in ok Google, set a timer for 20 minutes now I'm going to uh, bake the bread with 20 minutes with the lid on 20 minutes with the lid off and then it's done because we have a convection oven and uh, if you have a conventional oven you might have to add another 10 minutes without the Dutch oven to get nice and uh, crisp crust. Okay, I better turn this off so Walmart doesn't show us any more ads. Um, yes, and uh, now the bread is, uh, is baked. The baking process continues um, after you take it out of the oven. Uh, it is very tempting because it is, this smells very nice. It's very tempting to um, to cut into the bread right away, um, but um, it's it's better to let it cool down for, for about two hours uh, because the baking process inside um, the um, the bread actually continues. Um, so so that is uh, uh, is the bread. So obviously my bread does not include any preservatives or or any additions. Um, and I usually keep it in a cloth bag in the bread box. And uh, I in a regular week I bake uh, one of these artisan loaves and one or two sandwich loaves. And what we don't eat in the next two or three days, uh, I just keep uh, in a Ziploc bag in the freezer and thaw it as, as we need it. And that works out really well. Um, yes. And we end up having a few more minutes for questions. I'm uh, happy to answer those. If you have any questions later, uh, feel free to, um, to email me or, or or find me in the college and, and ask them. If anybody would like some starter to get going, give me a few days notice and we'll arrange for you to get them somewhere in Kelowna and uh, I'll set you up on that. Maybe because we have time, um, it's also on my blog, but before because we have time, I could share my favorite cookbook. Um, this is, uh, artisan sourdough made simple by Emily Rafa. Um, and all of these recipes are really easy. They kind of follow the same principle that I, I have here. And uh, I highly recommend this. Um, and it explains everything very easy for, um, for, um, um, for lay people like, like me. Any questions? Thank you for all the comments. I, uh, great job, thank you. Yeah, Sarah I just wanted like to, to say thank you so much for the job. That was really amazing. I feel like I learned so much about the science behind it and uh, all your special techniques that make your bread look so amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. Um, if you if you Google sourdough or 
go on YouTube, you will spend hours and hours of uh, different people making different experiments and, and stuff. Um, it's definitely something from 2020 where so many people started and so many people became experts. Uh, I'm not an expert in this. I just like to share what I learned and the way it works for us. Um, maybe the, what you might hear is people talking about different hydration of, of sourdough. Um, I use what is called 100% hydration. That means my starter has 50%, like it has 50 grams of starter, 50 grams of flour, and 50 grams of water when I mix it up. Um, and some, oh, my bread needs attention. Okay, Google, thank you. Doesn't always listen. We, we do have a question um, while you're getting the, the bread out. Um, what happens if you can't bake one week? Can the starter dough sit longer? Yes, it, it, it does. Some people have forgotten their starter in the fridge and have said, well, after three months, I just uh, started to feed it a couple of days and it was fine. Um, what kills the starter is uh, when it catches mold. Um, so mold would ki kill the starter. Uh, when I, uh, in the first couple of months, I kind of limped along. My breads were edible and were fine, but they were not satisfactory. And it seemed like the starter was getting less and less bubbly. Um, that was probably because I kept feeding it uh, bleached flour. Uh, and so I started my own starter. Basically, if you start your own starter, you basically feed it twice a day. Um, and at some point there are enough, uh, enough yeast uh, cultures that have formed that you can actually use it. It's, it's that simple. Uh, but there also, you can also, I have dried some of my starter. So if this happens again, uh, I can just use the starter, feed it a couple of times and it will come back. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, I, I do, I mean, uh, I have baked almost every weekend since, since I started. We don't have an air conditioner in our house. So when it, the heat dome was on and it was 40, like 35 degrees in here, I did not turn the oven on. So what I did then, uh, just to make sure that the precious starter would not be unhappy, I just took it out and fed it once or twice and, and, and uh, kept going and bought bread. That was quite the experience. Went to a bakery and bought bread. Any more questions? So I have recorded this session. And as you see, uh, I have some videos as well. Um, I will edit that up a little bit and, and share it on my blog. I don't know, Michelle, uh, um, if you are, if, if you're sharing all these sessions on, on the OC website somewhere, but uh, yeah. We can, we can find out from um, Samantha from the organizing committee and she probably, they probably have a list of everybody who signed up. So maybe we could, if it's not being shared, perhaps we could ask if we could, if they could email it to the participants. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks for coming and uh, I'll see you in the other um, sessions again if you have any questions later or 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 have an, any ideas what to do uh, just uh, drop me a line and uh, I'll be happy to chat thanks yeah, very sure. much this has been very educational thank you can't wait to try some thank you bye for now bye